Mike and I met about, I reckon, a year ago at the New York Public Library. Yes. At a big party. And um, we, we talked uh, dance. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, and um, so now today we're going to talk about dance. And I'm gonna, I have my, uh, my very important questions on my phone here, so don't think I'm checking my email while we talk or looking at pictures of my son. What I'm doing is going for my... So, <clears throat> you're at the, Mark is absolutely, of any artist we've ever had here, Mark is absolutely at the top of his field. Completely at the top of his field. There is no one you can really, you know, in a, in a, in a comparative field, I can't even think of the person who would be that high up as Mark and is his. So, what we're dealing with is somebody who for... When did you first put on your first professional ballet performance, or your first public ballet performance, not counting when you were a child? As the Mark Morris Dance Group, it was 1980, and I did a concert. My first concert was at Dance Theatre Workshop, which is now New York Live Arts or something. They've gotten the dance, they purged dance from the title of their right. organization now. But yeah, 1980, it, yeah, I guess it was 1980. It's so, the first time we called it that, and it was a show of just my work. And uh, I want, there's so many questions I want to ask you, but so 1980, so that's... Uh, a long... 32 years yes. ago. Yes. And for 32 years, you've been, you know, your, st your star has kind of risen, and pl there's been backlash, possibly. Mm, backlash yeah. against the backlash. Oh, yeah. There's been... Definitely. There's been ups, ups... Is it fair to say there's been ups and downs, Mark Morris? It, that's right. Okay, so it's let's... Been, just, it's been a roller coaster no. ride. <laughs> What a, what a newly yeah. waxed image that, that is CNN. for me. I love I've it. I've heard that on CNN. Um, how did you know, when you were a kid, what was it about dance that made you want to be a dancer? Um, well, that's, that's it. Dancing, everybody actually likes dancing better than not dancing. <laughs> everybody who's a child, anyhow. Anybody, you know, you know, at first, after you learned how to walk, then you figure out if you're pretty bright and usually if you're a girl, which is, um, then you figure out how to skip, and then you like that better than walking, and so you skip even though, you, sometimes it's only on one leg at first, step, hop, step, step, hop, step, but skipping is more fun, and spinning around is more fun than just standing still when there's a bunch of adults boring you, or, you know, it's like sliding down a banister is much more interesting than, you know, not. So I think that, that's what happens. Like you find the fun way to get someplace instead of just walking. You're running or two steps forward and one backwards. Don't step on the crack. All of these rituals and these scary Great. countings to eight, which I used to do in my tiny mind. Why did you count to eight? I don't know. <laughs> but it used, I used to count to eight and start every phrase with my right foot. So that's, there's a name for that. Autism? Uh, <laughs> Choreography, oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Obsessive, whatever. I don't know. Yeah. But so that, and then I would trick myself. No one's ever heard. I've never said this before. This is completely new. This revelation. This is the kind of shit you get at That's right. people. I'm sure that happens to a lot of people. It's like you figure out how this has to work. You know, it's like tapping something 200 times before you know. It's, it's kind of the compulsive. tale. It's kind of the story of evolution, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And do you think at some point... And it has girl... to do with filling. It has to do with filling in spaces and, you know, making things symmetrical. I wonder why it was eight rather than four. Because that's, you know, like I'm thinking musical measures. Yes. Because that's what you're so counting was yeah. in, wasn't uh -huh. it? Yes. Do you think there's a point at which girls start skipping and boys start marching? Well, I don't know. Yes, there probably is. But there's also, and, you know, much to my dismay as a feminist and as a queer... It's very upsetting to me when those, uh, f those uh, previously mentioned boys and girls turn sticks into dolls or guns. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like, what? Of course that's impossible. That's just from us programming these poor children. It's like, I'm sorry to say, I wish it weren't true, but it's completely true. So yeah, I mean, I was a sissy and I was also a, a boy. I was both. And so I did all of those things. You know, I obviously was dressing beautifully as a child and cooking <laughs> and, you know, singing. I did everything beautifully tell, and tell expressively. Us a, tell us about the family in Seattle, Washington, right? Okay, yes. That wa <laughs> what was the, what, what did this flourish? What did this, oh what, was the, what was the, the soil that what this flourished What is this, the Spanish from? Inquisition? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the soil was, 
my family, which was a wonderful, kooky family, um, at least now. My, my parents are both dead now. Um, I have two sisters who are thriving and are interesting. Um, there was lots of music. My father is a keyboard. He played the organ and the piano and taught me how to read music when I was about six. And I know he was a school teacher, so that means there was no work in the summer. You know, so he, would, he worked in a piano store. So I would spend all summer starting like five player pianos all at the same time, mm. and doing this sort of the Charles Ives uh, childhood, where I would just be in this piano store playing, you know, opening, you know, Henry Cowell like I would play the strings on the inside. And I invented the prepared piano. <laughs> at the same time that John Cage did, only he was, you know, an adult and I was just crazy. And so I was making up music all the time and making up little shows that I would force people to watch. You know, I did, any, whoever's old enough, no, you've, you know, TV has everything now, but the Lawrence Welk show, which I watch and wince at because it's so terrifying and reminds me of the very dark uh, his, the dark, not the horrible part, but the dark recesses of my past when I would, my parents or grandparents would watch this TV show and I would dance between them and the TV. <laughs> so I did a show, you know, that they, wa they were watching too like this and I was doing the numbers, you know, and in I front of them. <clears throat> I don't want to interrupt this flow, in fact, but <laughs> haven't you referenced some of that Lawrence Welk stuff a little bit in some of your work? In everything, yeah. Like hoedown, that hoedown? I do everything... Every, I, everything I do is from everything I've ever done, mm, of course. course. So, but then, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have that at my fingertips whenever I want it. But then also, I started folk dancing when I was, I was like 11 or 12. I started hanging out with adults who were doing... Country, is that country dancing? No, what is the, that? I started it's not with, Morris dancing. No, that, later on I learned some Morris dancing. Um, but... I did, I fell in with a group of kooky Israeli folk dancers. Mm. And so, you know, and this is also what the 60s, 70s, I had friends who were hippies. I was slightly too young to be a full-fledged hippie. So I had friends who were, and I was like an honorary young hippie. And so I started going to, you know, I didn't know that Israeli folk dancing was completely made up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was real, but it was really just to wear people out. You know? it's, just to, it's just to exhaust you. So you don't complain about the food on the kibbutz. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, I did that, and that led me to even stranger and naughtier adults who were doing legitimate... I mean, the, the Israeli dancing is real. It's just, you know, it's not very old. There's right, a couple right. of steps that are old. But um, So I started doing what was a very, very big influence on me, not just because of the sleepover weekends and the sex and the marijuana and the drinking, but the actual fabulous, fabulous folk dancing, Bulgarian primarily, what was then, perhaps you've heard of Yugoslavia, there used to be a Yugoslavia. And so I was doing Croatian dances and Pontic Greek dances and um, age Thracian from, Bulgarian what dances. Age? age from like, probably from 13. And I did that, I still do that. If I, still, if I go to a party and someone's doing this, I can slide into all of those dances because I know them. I can sight sing in Croatian, and you know, it's, it was a fabulous, wonderful thing. Because when I think of your stuff, and I mean, friends. we're going to, we're, what's that? <laughs> they were friends, yeah, they're well, still friends. When, when, when I think of your stuff, and I, for those who know something about Mark's choreography and making up dances, and for people who don't, uh, it is very, I mean, perhaps this is a stupid thing to say about a choreography, but it's music based. I mean, the music comes yes. first for you, doesn't it? Yeah. You hear music and you go, I want to what to that music? Right. What do you do? What is it? You hear a bit of music and you go, I'm going to make up a dance to it. What are you going to do with the dance? What's it doing for the music? What's to, it doing for you? Well, I also, the, the other thing that I did actually with, with um, formal training, from when I, I forgot this part, because when I, from when I was about nine, eight or nine, I was studying Spanish dance one day a week flamenco. from this crazy woman who was wonderful. Or? I was studying flamenco and later on Escuela Bolero and then later on Jota. By the time I, that's, I'm jumping ahead years because I became a Jotero once I went to Spain, I stopped flamenco. But anyway, that's, that, so I was very interested in these dances. And so at the school, the dancing school that I went to, uh, that my, comp my own building is now a dancing school. 
as opposed to a conservatory. You can just go there and dance. And so I would, I was always singing and dancing at the same time, which was one of the folk dance things, and that's one reason that I was drawn immediately to choreographing to vocal music, because it's something I do all the time, and I love to do that, because I think it's sort of the same thing, singing and dancing, it's just you, there's not necessarily other equipment, there is sometimes. But what happens is I hear music, I listen to music, I seek music out, I do my job as a choreographer because of music and exclusively because of music. Mm. I, don't, I don't have some fabulous idea and then find music or have music composed, or, although I work with living composers occasionally, there's an awful lot of good music by dead people that I use. And I don't, contrary to what my mother always thought, I don't see a dance in my head. I don't have dance dreams. I never, ever do. My mother would, you know, would tell me about her flying. She was always flying in her dreams and dancing. And like, it was a fabulous festival every night for her. <laughs> and for me, it was just like sort of sleeping. And if I wanted to make up a dance, I had to decide on it. I don't see dances in my head. That's a very important thing, because people start the, start the interview, which you didn't, um, with, so when you hear a music and visualize a dance, do you? It's right. like, no, 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 no. I don't at all. I have to <clears throat> make it up. And I always make it up. I start by walking, and I start by some gesture. I, I gesture a lot, because I think that's how people communicate. So my dances, although they owe, they owe a great deal to all of my what's I, what I would call folk dancing background, that people actually look at each other in the face and hold hands and instead of dancing at us, they dance for us. So we get to watch the dancing. It, it, no one's making us. It's not that much of a bully thing. I mean, I'm a terrible bully in rehearsal, but in the theater, I'm not. So you're not, you've <laughs> not got something that, for, I, I imagine some other choreographers, uh, have got something that they want bodies to do mm -hmm. that is an impressive thing. Right. That then, if there was some music there, that would mean that that would give them a reason to do it. That's right. That's completely the opposite way to how you work. Yeah, pretty much. So, you know, it's like I don't make up the big, you know, the, the human pyramid, everybody burst into flames, climax, <laughs> that you can only do once, usually. <laughs> I don't make that up. I see where it's going. And... Um, it, it, it's the way I, th I think musically, even when I've made up dances with no music at all, they're structured like music. I think, I think like music does. And, and, and while we're talking about music, I, and you're also well known for working with live music rather than pre-recorded music and wanting only to work with live music. And yet, of course, the beginning of your career, you did famously use bits of you know rock music that you couldn't mm -hmm. have like the, there's a violent femmes one i know and mm -hmm. and stuff like that. and old so, yoko ono with a yoko, piece with yoko, of yoko yoko and, right, right, right. and so what so what's that decision all about i mean i mean that i realize the very obvious answer to it it's more fun yes and not only that you get to spend way more money and it's more it's <laughs> double thought of that. it's double the pain in the ass it's f way more personalities in the room and it's never the same twice which is, of course, why it's so interesting. So I always, whenever I could, I would use uh, living music. Uh, what did you just hear? I just said Oh, OK. Um, whenever I could, I used music played by human people. Thank you. I, I, would, I wouldn't I didn't I'd want be on to the see, floor. I didn't want to see you do that. Yeah, OK. <laughs> just a second. Oh, wait, can everyone hear that? OK. <laughs> um, Whenever I, are you, are you yeah, texting so, Sorry, it's now? a text from my okay, wife. Okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> um, I, whenever I could, would use actual people playing music. And, you know, early on, a friend of mine when I was, she's still a friend of mine, when I was 13 or so, 12 or 13, I made up a dance, and she's a cellist, and I used her playing the cello, and I made up a dance. And nobody would ever think of doing that, because you would use, you only used, you know, the LPs that you collected, and you could only, you were only allowed in those days to choreograph to Carmina Burana of Carl Orff. Um, then for a while, it was, you were only allowed to choreograph to Philip Glass's music. And now, for some reason, it's Arvo Pert. Right. He's who everybody choreographs. It's like, well, hooray, I have that <laughs> record also. <laughs> I chose not to make up a dance to it. Um, there's a giant piece in today's New York Times, which I was reading coming here, which is pretty interesting about me versus music or how, how much I uh, come from the heritage of Paul Taylor, who's a 
uh, a senior choreographer. And in fact, my work is zero like Paul Taylor. Tell us about, tell, I know, I know the piece the is about thing, the yeah. children of Paul Taylor and the yeah. children of Merce Cunningham. Yeah. So fill us in, those of us who don't know yeah. so much about it, about why that's a schism, what the schism is, but, but don't make it a long explanation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I can't, it, it has to, it can only be long. In fact, I'll start at the last third of it. Great. Okay. So for the next 50 minutes, you'll, be, you'll hear about Paul. Paul Taylor and Merce Cunningham were both fabulous dancers in a time when uh, male dancers were rare. And uh, their glory is being? Oh, let's see. Well, let's see. Uh, Paul is 82 or something, mm. and Merce just died at 90. Mm. So that goes back. Mm. Um, they both danced with Martha Graham at some point, who was a fabulous nut of a choreographer. Um, and so Merce and John Cage, who were lovers, and uh, the, the composer John Cage, they went another direction and you know, went away from what Miss Graham was doing, which was mythological horror shows to contemporary composers. That a lot of whom we don't know anymore. Norman Della Gioia was one of them, and of course Copeland, she famously choreographed Copeland, and Louis Horst was her, her mentor. Anyway, Paul went the direction of making up beautiful dances to old music, and Merce went the direction of making up a dance that no one had ever seen before to zero music. And the music was supplied later, and, and uh, John would do it, or his colleagues. So Merce did the brilliant thing of he made up a dance, and to his last days in the studio, he was working with a stopwatch. Like, that is seven seconds too long. No wonder I'm so bored. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that's better. Um, so till the very last days, and it wasn't always like this, but it was mostly he would, he would commission a set designer, costume designer, lighting designer, uh, composer, and everything would hit the stage at the same time. They would learn a dance in silence to a stopwatch, and then the shit would hit the fan. The only thing that wasn't given full improvisational range was lighting, because when it was dark, you couldn't see anything. Right. So at least that's what, that's what Merce said. I don't know if that was true or not. And Paul, people align me with Paul Taylor because I my, ba my stuff doesn't look very balletic. Merce had a sort of a balletic tendency, and I do too. Um, and also that Paul famously choreographed his early pieces to Baroque music scores. Right. And I've always done a great deal of Baroque music. But the difference is I know music very, very well. Right. <laughs> So I actually, aesthetically, I aligned myself with Merce much more. He was, Merce was a friend of mine. So, so then the, the question that begs is, your breakthrough moment when you had been doing your um, ballets at art galleries, I think, or, or you know, putting on dance Around, scenes, yeah. at, you're right, was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, at the Next Wave Festival in BAM in, say, 1984. Right. Yeah. What did you add to that tradition or that world that made, or had you reached a kind of critical mass at that point where you were just the hip thing and everybody clustered around you? Or what, did you add something very specific that you knew what it was and they knew what it was? Was it an did you, did you have God. an effect in mind? What question are you asking me? Did did, I have an was it fun me? back in 83, Yes, Mark? it was. It was great. <laughs> I had been, I was why, known, why was it you? Why was it me? Why was it you? Wow, that's really interesting. I'm really good. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that's I'm the first excellent. sentence to that answer. Um, okay, do you want the, is this a short answer or a long answer? You can give any, okay, like, if you right. like, I'll just stop you. I, <laughs> I was known in, I did my first shows in 1980 as the Mark Morris Dance Group, and it was called that because they were friends of mine, and it was a group of people. I had no intention of making up, uh, of making a dance company happen. A friend of mine, the choreographer Lar Lubavitch, who I worked with in the early years. Well, to, 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 to stop you. Yes. Mark Morris Set. Dance Group. Yes. What is the implications of those four words in 1980? Why is that different? You, you said that uh, we called it this yeah. for. What would it have been called? The ballet no, ping pong? Uh, I mean, no, what here's, would it be called? The, the, what Lar said to me was he has the Lar Lubavitch Dance Company that I danced with for a while. And he said, You're not going to. His great advice to me was, You're not going to start a company, are you? Right, right, right. It's like, 
believe me, I've done it. It's a nightmare. It's right. hell on earth. And so I wasn't my intention to start a company. I put this group together. It was also the period, everybody's, da everybody's company was called like Mark Morris and Friends. <laughs> or if we were in Seattle, it was Mark Morris Dance Works Northwest. <laughs> and it was all lesbian, right? right? Except for Mark Morris, it was right. But anyway, um, so it was and friends or and company or whatever. It was also about the same time as coincidentally the Worcester group started, uh -huh. the Patty Smith group, all the groups that are still around ish. Mm. I called it a group because I didn't want it to be, well, my name was kind of Mark Morris Dance Group, it's still me, right? But it was my peers who I danced with with other companies. It was a pickup group of dancers. And it was your name in the title because you're making up the dances. Yeah, that's right. Right. Exactly. And a lot of people, a lot of choreographers don't make up their own work. They count on their well, collaborators. Their oh, dancers, I see what you're saying. You know, many choreographers come in and say, what have you got for me? Or why don't you bring in your journal and we'll do dances based on your penetralia. And that's, to me, very uninteresting yes. as a choreographer. So anyway, I just put on shows as the Mark Morris Dance Group in Seattle and in New York. Right. And so I had done that for a few years. Because and then, you're from Seattle. Yeah, because I'm from Seattle. And you're living in New York amongst, uh, you know, in somewhere Dancing downtown. Dancing for a lot of people. Right. And I lived in Hoboken. That's as downtown as you could get at that point. I moved out the day they, they opened the Crabtree in Evelyn on Washington <laughs> Street in, in Hoboken. Um, what happened, I was known as a dancer. I was known in the, what was apparently the dance boom of the seven, I didn't, I didn't hear it. I was there, but <laughs> it didn't seem like everything was great. It, there was more stuff, and there was more bad stuff and more good stuff. Um, so I had danced with the companies of Lar Lubavitch, Hannah Kahn, who was, a, who was a, still a wonderful choreographer, um, Laura Dean, dancers and musicians. My first job was with the, what was then called the Elliott Feld Ballet. Elliot's still a friend of mine and still choreographs. Um, and I did, I was sort of the person who was in rehearsal, kind of irritatingly improvising on the side. And then I would see my moves appear in somebody else's work. And of course, why, you know, it's like, oh, that's good. Let's do that. And then of course, I didn't know I was being really irritating. I thought I was just keeping myself entertained instead of just waiting around for somebody to come up with the step that I'd already made up. Mm. So. I kind of, my, I was very influential with these choreographers I worked with, and they're friends of mine still, but then I decided, since I'm kind of making stuff up already, let me just actually do that. So the thing about the Next Wave Festival, I was asked by Harvey Lichtenstein, who was then running Brooklyn Academy Music, and uh, to put on a show of my own. He'd seen my work at Dance Theater Workshop. So that meant much more attention it meant, it was in the Le Perc space, which is now the cafe. Right, right. right. You can get an overpriced panino there now, <laughs> instead of watching Meredith Monk, you know, which is what it used to be. So, enough of that. Enough panini also. And then you can go for a dance lesson at the Mark Morris That's Dance right. Center That's right opposite. Right. That my, my very good friend Peter Sellers, the director, calls... Uh, great comedian. Love his work. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. He's very good. That's fantastic. <laughs> love, love those pink the party, movies. The party. The party. Yeah, it's really good. Um, anyway, he refers to my building as the international headquarters for Mark Morris related studies. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he calls my studio. But actually, people who rehearse there and go to classes there call it Mark Morris, which is so weird. I've heard that people on the train say like, oh God, I have another horrible, boring rehearsal at Mark Morris. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I, also heard refer, you, I also heard you say, um, when asked about it, that you had uh, 800 wonderful uh, children dancing there and two assholes. Yeah. That's what you said. <laughs> yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so next wave, you're in I'm the... I'm so confused You're now. in the cafe. I'm in, performing in the cafe. You're serving panini as you That's dance. That's right. And I made up a program there. This is in 1984, and I did a piece... The, the, uh, I did a piece called um, Championship Wrestling after Roland Barthes, which was just like it sounds from this beautiful essay of his on, on wrestling. And then I did a piece called Mythologies from that collection called Mythologies. And I did, uh, and this was commissioned music. It was musique concrète. It was recorded, but it was from wrestling venues. And so it was, the piece turned out later to be Championship Wrestling, 
soap powders and detergents and striptease, which are three wonderful, wonderful essays of, of, of Bart. Where, of course, when I did those in Brussels, they said, how dare you read Bart? It's like, well, I thought it was kind of interesting. So anyway, um, so I did this one piece championship wrestling, and I did, uh, showed this dance that I'd done a couple years before, Gloria, to the Vivaldi Gloria in D, and a dance that was based on a trip I'd made to India, a little dance um, called Oranga Shai, which I did as a solo about a 15, 20 minute, really, really difficult solo based on my ignorance and adoration in relation to uh, Indian dance and South Indian Carnatic music and dance. So that was the program. And I was, I got the New Yorker, Arlene Croce, the genius, genius dance critic, who if you know her, probably only know about this piece that she wrote about Bill T. Jones that lost her her job. But read the piece again, because it's kind of amazing. Anyway, Arlene was writing for the New Yorker. I was on a plane moving to Seattle, because I had had enough of New York. So I was moving to Seattle to at least live there part time and teach at the University of Washington. Right. And so I'm on the airplane thinking, and I have the New Yorker, which I think is going to be a brush off review about four or five different choreographers of my generation. And it was only about my work. And so this full article in the New Yorker called Mark Morris Comes to Town. Right, as you're flying As out. I was flying <laughs> over, yeah. I was leaving, I've had it, I can't stand it here anymore. And I read this like, oh shit. <laughs> I guess I did that the wrong, in the wrong order. Anyway, and so then I worked for the next couple of years and why, why, in what, Seattle and, and New York. why was that the moment at which you were oh. in that way anointed? What do you put that down to, regardless of the truth you feel about it? Uh, it was needed. I was needed. Why? I was needed. Partly because um, I, used to be, uh, I used to be more sort of political and more sort of outspoken and more, I don't know, irritating than I am now, which is hard to imagine. But I was a super, uh, sort of a queer activist at the time. And it was important at that time, people as gay and as choreographic as Paul Taylor and Merce Cunningham weren't somehow. Paul Taylor was doing, and continues to in some way, a kind of work that to me, he, I, to me I think it's a sex problem. Um, which I wouldn't think if I were reading, if I were looking at a painting of Paul Cadmus or reading Lincoln Kirstein's books or something. It's this period, or the unbelievable photographer George Platt Lyons, who's a hero of mine. But this sort of super weird, Tom of Finland also comes to mind. This sort of super straight ish gayness in relation to men and women, where I think in a lot of times it's a, a sort of a, a kind of misogyny that is also too scared of men to, I don't know, it's just a weird kind of fear. And so making up these hyper straight, meaning what straight people call heteronormative, which is one of my favorite words in the university. <laughs> heteronormative, itty. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, oh, oh oops, sorry. <laughs> You have to get used to the students because what happens? No, what happens is they have a. I'll cla never get used no, to students. No, they have a class. They have a class that starts now. Uh huh. I'm giving okay. them a very gender good gender studies. Could be gender. <laughs> okay. Right. So, they have a class. Okay. I used to have class. Um, so I was at that point what I was called all the time self-proclaimed gay choreographer. Self-proclaimed. Yes. I, well, who else is going to say it? Everybody else knows well, it. But I, I want to say. Do, it was it's not something it. you're talking about, a generational thing. Yes, it absolutely Because they're is. from the more Benjamin Britten and Peter Pears generation right. where, you know, it was illegal. Right, and it was it actually was, illegal. It was actually illegal, yeah. like it was when you lived in Spain. Right, It was exactly. actually illegal. Definitely. And so that was less true. It was becoming less so. There was a lot going on, and I became the irritatingly gay choreographer. Right. And now I don't need to be because that particular battle is one enough for me to back off it. Right. And, you know, I was glamorous and outspoken and f semi-famous as a dancer. So people were coming to see my show because it was me and my friends who were fabulous dancers from the companies I was working with. And this is because you 
rather than anything your art particularly tried to dictate to an audience, mm -hmm. your true personality is shining through in the work that you do. Yes. Because you are, you know, doing something you love and believe in, and therefore what you represent on the stage with you and your dancers right. becomes the things that you represent. So, right. So good messages, people. Good, yeah. good messages. So it was famously, you know, because it takes up a lot of column space when you write a review that says, and the partnering was men and women, women and men, men and men, women and women, a, two women and a man, you know, it's like a dog, you know, so it was this listing of all the possibilities, like, I know, I just made up that dance. Right, right, and right. And indeed, there were un, unveiled uh, homosexual revelations in my work that weren't pornographic, that were just looking at somebody or touching somebody in a way that if, you know, it could only be done comically. It's like, oh, you know, the girl moves out of the way at the last minute and you almost kiss the guy. It's like, ooh, I'm not going to kiss you. You're a fella. You know, it's like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when in fact a lot of people like to kiss fellas. <laughs> so, um, although my work, the dances were never autobiographical, except in the sense that everything anybody does is autobiographical. It was, the biggest thing was my allegiance to music. Because in the, the very first show, I didn't have live music. There was a commissioned score, but it, it was made for, to be recorded. Um, so my allegiance to music, the initiation of my work from musical sources and using old music. I did a lot of Baroque and early classical music. And then as soon as possible, and as much as possible, living musicians. So that was part of it. It's like, I was so old-fashioned slash avant-garde. So it was against Merce and John, which it wasn't. I loved their work and continue to, and I've, he was a big, important model for me as a thinker and an artist. And anti-Paul Taylor, who I thought n just had a tin ear and never really related what he was doing to the music, but it was happening at the same time. It's, I don't know. And they're still talking about it in the New York Times today. Yes, right? that's right. Here's a, here's, I'm moving tack slightly. On your Wikipedia page, this, this begs a whole question. It, there's, a, there's a quote. Is there a Wikipedia? This, the, the, yeah, yeah. What is the state of Wikipedia, Mark Morris? <laughs> um, his body was heavier than that of the typical dancer, more like that of an average person. It's a polite way of saying... When was that from? Today on Wikipedia. Oh, today? Yeah. On Wiki oh, wow, okay. His body was heavier. Yeah. Is heavier? Well, I don't perform anymore. Right. So, um, what what is that person say? What that person saying is? Were you aware of being differently? You know what you were offering as a male well, ballet dancer. Well, I wasn't dancer? fat then. Right. I mean, I'm fat now because I quit dancing and I'm middle aged and I don't run around. You know, I used. To, here's the thing. I spent my whole. Oh, it just got cool in here. Um, I spent my whole school time, meaning up through the, you know, I graduated high school a year early because I hated it more than life itself, and escaped and went abroad for my senior year. But I had spent all my time trying to get out of gym class because I hated it. It was horrible, and it was before, I, I don't know, it was before every single person had a, their own personal bully. There was like a bully at school who took care of everybody. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, um, so it was like, I, hate, I hated the culture of it. I didn't like any sports at all. I did some fencing, but what's gayer than fencing, you know, really? Like, um, so I was, I did everything I could to get out of gym class. So then when later on, when everybody, all of my gay brothers and sisters started going to the gym, I was like, what? I spent the whole time trying to escape this, and now we're competing for muscles and, outfits and you know it's like oh come on this is a nightmare so I've always hated that the exercise I did was always dancing and so you know now if you know if I drank half as much I wouldn't be as fat as I am but it's also I don't I don't have the same job as I used to so my company always and I'm including myself it always looked like people because it was always people Joan Akuchawa in that biography called Mark Morris the biography of Mark Morris by Joan Akinjala. <laughs> she, she thinks, and I think it's her, I think it's her obsession, she thinks I'm like crazy about asses. That all of my work is about somebody's ass. That everyone's always turning around and going away from you or bending over. It's like, well, I know. There's going to be a lot of that, isn't gonna, there? Yeah. <laughs> there's gonna, there has to be, all right? So, it's going to be almost 50%, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Um, so we should take this on the road. There's, there's an ad, there's an ad for New York One or something that just started where it says opinions are like noses. Oh. Everybody has. I was like oh. opinions are like what what what, and they don't say it, which is sad. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I show the work in dancing. It was never my intention for people to pretend that they weren't tired or fatigued or working hard. You know, so that became my company, which has always included a whole bunch of different kinds of people, as opposed to the ballet industry uh, stamp of approval, which is needed in the ballet industry, and it isn't needed in the work that I do. Right. So, which you know, I always had dancers of <coughs> color and dancers of gender and dancers, dancers of gender. yeah, and, and you know, everybody could dance. The reason they were dancers is because they danced great, not because whoever showed up so, off the bus is in the show. For, for the dummies amongst us, yes, you're making up dances, yeah. and and people who do Swan Lake are making up dances. But is there something where you, at one point, you go, it isn't that kind of ballet that requires those. The classical ballet. What's, mm -hmm. what's, where's the distinction there in your mind, or I mean, or has it all exploded now? Because it seems to me that if one was to go to the Paris Opera, as I once did, to mm -hmm. see Nureyev dance, mm -hmm. you know, I knew what I was going to get, even aged fifteen or fourteen, mm -hmm. however old I was, and it wasn't going to be what I got at BAM when I came to see right. my, my, the shows of yours that I've seen. Right. So, what's where? It, where, do, where does that stop? Just because certain halls demand that kind of thing? No. Um, first of all, I have to tell you something about Mr. Nureyev, who, is, who was running the Paris Opera Ballet when and he asked me to choreograph a dance for them. He was already very ill. He was on his way out. So there was sort of an interregnum mess of nobody running the company. He asked me to do a ballet, and I did. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. But Why? He, um, because... We'll, we'll be appalled with you, but do tell us the funny really? story. The funny story is he was a fabulous, famous dancer. I saw him perform a few times, and he wore white tights for everything. Like, very, so tight, they're like, you know, uh, subcutaneous, basically. <laughs> Which to me is so frightening. When I first went to the ballet, it was like, uh, are you kidding me? They're wearing nothing, these people. So anyway, he's in white tights, and he used to famously, before he went on stage, go like this with his, he had you know, like huge makeup on, and he would go like this, and like this to do a highlight at his crotch area. Right, right, right. Just so it was like, amazing. So he shadowed in his, uh, you know, basket. I don't know what we call that. Fame, it was very famous. He always did that. Um, and he do, had, do people ever and he had people, do people ever dry pad? his dance belt, you know, his little support garment with a hair dryer because he only wore one. And so he would have a, a young man usually dry it with a hair dryer during intermission. Are they, are they ever padded? Is that are they ever padded down there? They're, a they're slightly padded. It's only There's so not, you look more like Ken. When I was a kid, I thought it was like a ledge that the women could stand on when they went up. But that's not, that's not what it's for at all, is it? Depends. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like it's, it, it, it neutralizes, it neuters you, but also draws huge attention to yes, that yeah. area. It's like, wait, what's, what's that swelling? <laughs> if there's something wrong. Um, but it's also in, in classical ballet and in training for that, it's not just like a, a jock strap to keep you from getting a hernia. It's to keep your, uh, what are they called, balls out of the way <laughs> so that you can cross your thighs far enough. Because you work so turned out that you, to, to be able to be in fifth position <coughs> with this super twisted cross thing, you have to have nothing between your right, legs. Right, so right, you just right, move right. it out and up. I did, just didn't know we were going here, people. I didn't either, but <laughs> people don't know that. You know, so it's anyway, like so when I teach ballet class for my company, it's like, you know, are you just wearing underpants because it's not working? Right, right. So, so Nureyev, you're, you're doing a ballet. You're, you're yeah, I did a ballet, and of course, they're famously, um, the famous hierarchy of the 18th century, which is what the year, it's like 1794 at the Paris Opera Ballet. As soon as you go in the door, it's a terrifying place. And... They, they're ranked in seven categories, from Corifé, slave girls, to uh, les étoiles, mm -hmm. the people who are, are the stars and they, who've never performed. And then there are, of course, these character parts of old people who play old people. So it's great, except I have always choreographed 
I, dem democratically isn't the right word, because cer it's certainly a tyranny, but I use the people who I think dance really well. So when I work, and I work in the classical ballet industry a lot. I right. choreograph four ballet companies. I just did a piece for San Francisco Ballet, my eighth or ninth piece for them. So I speak that language, and I work in that language. My dancers train in that language. We have ballet class every day. And uh, so where was I? Oh, Paris Opera Ballet. I would have somebody just step in. It's like, oh, you partner her, and you partner, and, and, and she goes like, <laughs> like, no, he's not my rank. He's in the corps de ballet. I can't right. touch him. Right. And they meant it. And then, they, then she'd go over and talk to her tiny little dog who was in her bag, <laughs> right over by the bar, like, nobody understands me except you. <laughs> and it was, it was insane. And another thing was, I had the, co the costumes were very revealing. It was to one of the a little known Bach cantata. And it was with wonderful singers, countertenor, tenor, and um, a very good period band. Uh, so they already hated that because I was using mm. Baroque music. And <clears throat> the costume design was there were all these, it was half women and half men, and everybody sh showed a lot of flesh. The designs were beautiful but quite revealing. And for dress rehearsal, I came in, and all of the boys had completely shaved their bodies from head to toe. So they looked like salamanders. Mm. <laughs> and you they, know, they had this makeup on and the hair, and it was like, it was like Bejar in the 60s or something. It was like, it was insane. It's like, wait a minute. I wanted you to look they how you look. They photoshopped themselves. It was terrifying. Yeah, it yeah. was terrifying. So they looked like sea lions or something. Yeah, yeah. And then they completely screwed up my day. I, I went in to choreograph, as I often do as a choreographer, I'll start a piece with, even if it's going to be a solo, I'll start it with everybody in the room, right? My whole company, because I just work things out. So I was going to make these three very important, dramatic, small duets, pas de deux. And so I had three principal couples, male and female, heteronormative couples, and they were going to have the connecting tissue of this dance between the arias and the choruses the, during the recits. And so I started choreographing with three of them because I was going to use the same material, the same moves in throughout the piece because that's how I work. So I make up a whole bunch of shit and then edit it and move it around and get rid of a lot of it and use it in a later dance if it's still interesting. And so I went in one day and there's a couple on the side of the room like <laughs> freaking out. And my French is fine, but, you know, they didn't socialize with me too much. And also the studio, like the stage is raked. So at the very top of the, the, uh, the Garnier Opera House, there's a circular studio where the floor is at this angle because that's how the theater is. So it's impossible to work there. Right. You know, you put down, your coffee rolls down, yeah, your yeah. dog. It's like trying to get... Yeah. And so I'm rehearsing in there, this beautiful old historic theater studio, and I come in for my three couples and there's one ready to dance. And they're, they're like this. And it's not just because they're French, it's because it's a whole ballet thing too. <laughs> and I said, what, what happened? And they said, oh, those two couples left because they didn't want to be in this pas de cease. I said, but it's always, they were going to have a giant part, as right. the featured couple. Right. But they couldn't wait the hour yeah. to see that that was going to happen. Yeah. So anyway, the dance turned, you know, they did everything that it was asymmetrical. The dance happened all over so, the place. So what, they just showed up at center stage to do what they do. So, so it's like, what, what, here I am. What you're saying basically is that the culture of it is mm -hmm. very different to what you're doing, yes. and that sometimes makes it difficult to work in because though you know the moves and speak the language, yes. they're not humans behaving like humans. They're humans behaving like a construct of what a ballet dancer should behave right. like. They're, imi they're impersonating. Uh, yeah. They're peasants in relation to some aristocracy that they've never heard of. Right. So they're in the back yeah. with a, you know, with a. Uh, a, a chalice that has nothing in it. Yeah. You know, greeting each other over and over again, like, oh, how's it going? I could do that much better than she could. Oh, let's, you know, let's yeah. put, it's this bullshit acting. It happens in opera a lot where the background doesn't count. And so people are not even paying attention. They don't even know the story of Swan Lake, half of them. Right. You know, they're just yeah. like, oh, how, you know, how do I look? You know. <laughs> and then the people in front, the soloists, never turn around. They never see anything behind them because that's how a lot of classical ballet is composed, especially with a rake and in a proscenium theater. And then the solo, the principal just comes on for a second to do the hard moves and then goes back to her dressing room and calls her agent. So from the, that's the hierarchy of the 
of the society of the company is from background to foreground. And the fact that Merce Cunningham turned it around so that people do actually see it's the great, back. And great. Joan can see our asses, great. finally. Great. So, and that also made the floor not raked. Great. And it made all parts of the stage of value instead of just the middle part. Okay, part now, in a moment, I've got two little quick questions. In a moment, I'd like to throw it open to the floor if anybody's got some questions I'm I'll certainly be happy to answer I them. love <laughs> classical ballet I work in that language and I love it and the answer is my dancers are far more versatile than the general ballet dancer in a ballet company mm. I have 18 dancers in my company who can do anything and with anybody mm. as opposed to the 75 or 100 dancers at San Francisco who, Ballet right. who if one of them's injured the show's cancelled yeah. you know it's like so it's a very different thing. I respect and enjoy them. And the men have to be big enough to pick up the tiny women and throw them around. <clears throat> They're not all dying of bulimia. Mm. You know, they have to be little for this job. Mm. And you have to, at a certain age, you can't do it anymore. It's, and I've, you know, I like old people. They're more fun to go on the road with. I'm sorry, everybody. But <laughs> in the hotel and the only restaurant open in the college town after the performance, mm. you don't want to be, I don't want to be with a bunch of, Shall, can I say 17 year olds? I can because everybody's older than that, right? Yeah. So I want interesting people who can read and talk and think and dance beautifully. Um, Sorry. No, what, I, I'm, I'm still getting over the, the peasants and the aristocracy <laughs> quote. Which it's like, was what year fantastic. is it? Okay. What year is it? Yeah. Two, 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 <laughs> two, two questions. Because I know that you love um, music so much. And obviously your job is making up dances for fantastic mm -hmm. music, and you particularly love vocal music. Is it a frustration to you, or have you successfully achieved ever, a place where people are, and I realize it's a difficult thing to do, but singing and dancing at the same time? How much could do it be done? Do we ever do that? Or, that's what I'm asking you. Well, in fact, a couple, a couple of citations of that. We can do my Dido and Aeneas, we can rehearse it with no musicians because everybody knows every word and every tune and every word. It doesn't sound good, mm. but everybody can do it. Mm. And Dido I, and Aeneas is a, but what was the first English opera, perhaps, the, written by Henry Purcell? Yeah. And it's about, what, 55 minutes long? Yes. Yeah. Thank God, because there's a prologue that's missing. Thank God, it would be really boring. Oh, is that right? I didn't even know that. Cupid prologue, Cupid, huh? Cupidian prologue. Yeah, so it's about an hour. It's Purcell, and it's, it's, it's amazing. an amazing, it's amazing, amazing piece, yeah. yeah. So I choreographed that years ago. I used to dance the, that And you're doing part. it in New York in now August. I'm, yeah, in August, mostly Mozart at the Rose Theatre. By now, I'm conducting, and Stephanie Blythe, the great mezzo, is singing Dido. So it's going to be something. Anyway, an example is I choreographed for Peter Sellers, the director, long ago, um, the world premiere production of The Death of Klinghoffer which uh, he wrote, John Adams wrote with Alice Goodman, a controversial piece, beautiful. And I choreographed this piece, and we were, we were rehearsing it. It's very, very difficult. John Adams' music is really hard rhythmically, and you know, it's just really, really difficult, and it was new. Maestro Kent Nagano was conducting. We were in Vienna. My dance company is the dancers in it. And so everybody's dancing around, and the band just started falling apart. It was an orchestra rehearsal. It wasn't a performance. People started dropping out, and it's like, you know, you know, where are we, eh, 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 eh. And it's like, okay, turn the page, and what are we singing, and the chorus are on stage, they can't, they, everybody's just lost, and there's a set, they're running up and down, and you know, the place is falling apart. My dancers who are dancing super fast in this really difficult music that changed, changes meter every couple of bars, were so tired and frustrated that they just started singing. So the orchestra's stopping one, you know, just like grinding to a halt, and they're like spinning around and dancing, and they're doing these really complicated words, and change, you know, in eleven sixteen, and like, mm -hmm. and Kent got furious. The maestro got furious because we didn't need him. Kind yeah, of. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> there. But we can, can be you done. know, and also my King Arthur that I did, um, Purcell's King Arthur. The dancers sing quite a bit. Right. Oh, is that that's which you're not supposed to do with the unions, but you can met, you can lip sync, but you're not supposed to actually because make. Because I sound. suppose in opera sometimes you have to have like a, the people singing off stage and the dancers kind of represent the people who are singing. Right. Whereas sometimes you must have the singers 
No, no, no. It can only work that way around. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, if, you know, if I'm working with singers who can kind of dance, I have them kind of dance a little bit. Right, right, right. <laughs> what did, uh, tell us this. This, this seems very important to me suddenly. Okay. How much music do you play yourself? Do you play the piano? Do you play the guitar? Do you play... Oh, no, I don't play anything. You don't play anything? No, I read music fully fluently, and at gunpoint, I could get through anything on the piano, but I have no technique. I never did that. Um, I sing very enthusiastically. <laughs> I, once, I once heard you say in an interview that there any ambitions to conduct, to which you answered, electricity. <laughs> Really? That's, that's funny. That's good, right? That's pretty good, yeah. That's good. And now one more thing before we throw it open. This completely left field because <laughs> I certainly didn't read anything about it in Joan's book about you. Is there any... I don't even know what made me think of it. Jack Benny. Um, kind of older comedians. Is there any influence there? And going back to silent comedians? Buster that's very Keaton, interesting. Do you feel anything of that at all? Because when I saw one of your shows, yeah. I remember at BAM, I remember thinking of a couple of reference points, but it wasn't just, you know, the Keystone Cops. I'm not right. talking about that. I'm talking more about the gesture and the, the, the ex of the early comedians. I, I don't know why I thought of Jack Benny, but that's that, that kind of expansive double take, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Do you fi feel any influence there? Do any of those people mean something I to worship you? Jack Benny. Oh. Yeah. I don't like the movies of Charles ding! Chaplin. You don't like movies. I don't Charles like Chaplin. Charles Chaplin's work very much. What's that? I don't know. It's too. He feels sorry for himself too much. I loved Harold Harold Lloyd. I love Aunt Buster Keaton, the great 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 genius. <clears throat> um, but you know, I like I like fun. I'm kind of funny, and I like funny stuff, mm. which is why I usually hate any attempt at dance humor, because it's guaranteed to just make you cover your eyes and shake your head slowly, because it's never funny. I mean, well, I've done some funny stuff. Also, but people, people kind of over laugh at really stuff. Bad. People uh -huh. kind of over laugh at stuff sometimes, which can be annoying. If they hear someone's a bit new or a bit different, they can laugh at things that aren't even meant to be yeah. funny because they feel like them. You've, have you, you've experienced I that. have the reputation long ago. I was referred to as zany. Oh, dear which comes from the Italian, but we can get into that later. And I thought, so then it would be that we would go on tour and, it, and someone read that something was funny. So I would come on stage and people would just scream laughing. And right. I hadn't done anything yet. I'd, no jokes, no pratfalls, no asses even. It's just, oh God, now what do I do? Now they've decided that everything is going to be funny and it's not. But so. the hard nut, I mean, the it's beginning funny. of the hard oh, nut is funny. funny. The, the whole point is that that's oh, funny. Yeah. Uh, Mark's, one of his most famous pieces that I saw at the Zellerbach Auditorium in Berkeley uh, is the Nutcracker Suite. Oh, I'm sure a lot of you know, and it's called the hard nut. And you set it in the 70s, I yeah. suppose, is the easiest way to right. put that. Yeah. And now you used to dance one of the, well... I was the drunk party guest. You've always been the drunk party guest. I've, no, I got promoted. I'm now the father. I'm now Dr. <laughs> Stahlbaum. Well, what, when did you... I was the drunk party guest and the beautiful Arabian princess. <laughs> and then, actually, the TV version there isn't the Arabian dance in it. And then I got promoted to Dr. Oh. Stahlbaum, and I'm, also, I'm working on conducting it eventually. When did you, and why did you, stop dancing yourself? <laughs> did it just hurt too much? <laughs> well, first of all, I only danced my own work. Right. So that's great. So if, I, if it was hard to get up off the floor, I'd just stop putting in getting up off the floor. <laughs> so, you know, right, go to the floor, curtain. <laughs> or everybody go to the floor, but I'll remain standing, you know. Um, yeah, well, I had a couple, everybody gets injured all the time if you're dancing. I'm, I've always been sort of pretty healthy. But what happened was that I started looking like the scary guy in the van outside the playground with the fake lost puppy. And my company was the wonderful, darling young people who had no clue that I was going to dismember them. Right, right. That's what it started to feel like. I'm on stage feeling like a scary old thing that shouldn't be there. And that, you know, I used that. I made up some dances that were about that. And I still perform a little bit, but... It, I didn't belong there. I, I saw you do there. an incredible thing at BAM, which I, I think you would refer to as a solo, where you were wearing more or less a kimono. Yes. And I think you had fans, probably, or... Yeah. Or or that was the last dance I did for me. 
yeah. because that was it felt like if you know what I mean, I don't refer to your death, but perhaps when you were going to stop dancing, it felt like late style in the sense that your gestures were within... The, yeah, it's going to be too much for you, isn't it, Mark? But it was fantastic, and it was incredibly beautiful. Thank you. That's okay. That no more a, of that, then. That was a dance. What was it, it called, it that was one? called It was called Serenade, because it was a right, piece right. that um, my darling, dear friend, Lou Harrison, the wonderful composer, if you don't know his music, find out about it. Lou was a good friend of mine, and he'd written music for me. I commissioned some music from him, and I decided to make up this solo based on some dances that I'd seen old people do. And I was, I was a little bit oldish. And so it, the, it scored for guitar and percussion. And so the dance itself is composed of elements of wood and metal, like percussion and guitar. So I used a dance, I did a dance with a, a brass tube, a copper tube that the light hit, that that was based on a dance I'd seen the old Remy Charlep, who was a wonderful dancer and ex-boyfriend of Lou Harrison's, did a dance with a metal tube once that I liked. I, then I had a wooden fan right. that I did a, a tribute to Bando Tamasaburo, the great Onagata, the great kabuki performer who I love. He's about my, a little bit older than me. He only plays women. And then I, I had called, and I did, I forget, there are finger symbols that are in the score. So there's a Turkish rhythm that I did, and I played the finger symbols myself. And I was going to call Lou on the phone to ask if I could please use castanets, because I'm an expert castanet player. Um, and I was a going to call, you know, it's that thing where somebody dies mm -hmm. and you wish you'd mm -hmm. called him that time mm -hmm. and you didn't. It's like, mm -hmm. oh shit, like I, he would have lived longer or something. It's like, no. But I didn't call him and I decided that posthumously he would have given me uh, permission, permission yeah, yeah. to use castanets. So I wrote a castanet part out to play with this piece. So it's all with props, guitar, percussion, I play percussion and use props and it it's, is about uh, Cons about essentializing action, then I think that any artist who lasts more than a week is in the process always of seeing what you can get rid of without just dying of boredom. You know, where it becomes completely blank. It's like, hmm, I guess I went too far. There has to be a little something. Mm -hmm. And I, I and all of my friends who work in a whole bunch of different arts find that. Mm -hmm. and, and you're lucky if you get to do that when you're still old enough when you're still young enough to be able to do some of it and old enough to be smart enough to know what you shouldn't and should be doing. Mm. Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. Now, uh, if anybody's got a question, we've certainly got uh, a few minutes for them. That answer was for the old and young alike. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, please? Yeah. Do I notate dances? Well, my stock answer for that used to be much more powerful than it will be now, um, which is I, I, there are several systems of dance notation that are basically worthless. And I used to say the only one that was any good was an Etch-a-Sketch, but you can't say that anymore, that I would record a dance and then shake it at the end of rehearsal. But, you know, that's, I'm sorry, that's too bad. I made that up. Okay. Um, anyway. No, we record everything, pretty much every performance and a lot of rehearsals. We, I have a camera in the studio that records dances. I never look at them. I have a very, very good assistant who writes things. I have a pianist, because I only work with live music, including in the studio, and he writes stuff in the score. And the, the oral tradition, which is a wonderful one in the world of dancing, people actually still teach younger people how to do stuff. It's amazing. So when you join a dance company, any dance company, you, the first thing you learn, you learn parts that other people have done. And like the costume has somebody else's name on it. And it's really interesting. And as soon as I can with new dancers, I try to make up a dance that it's their dance for the first time. So consequently, when I put a dance, you know, like I, I hired several people a couple years ago. I lost three dancers all at the same time. It was fine. And I got these people in. And they learned to dance brand new from me very early on. They were men. And then we went to put the dance together a couple years later, and they started dancing like babies. I said, well, just a minute. 
oh, that's right. That was the first dance you learned in this company. So you're doing it the way you used to dance two years ago. And now you're much better and stronger and smarter. So grow up is basically what I said. So when we, and they're fab, you know, it's like, oh, right. I can stand on one leg now longer. Why don't I do that? You know, because people, you know, you just get, you get used to that thing that fits that, in that compartment. So putting a dance together that's old, I always do that. I bring back old dances. I never change anything because then why don't I just make up a new dance because it takes about the same amount of time. And so people help each other. We refer to tape. Then I, it's put together for me by my team. And then I come in and watch rehearsals and repair everything because I remember everything but not to the boring part of now you go right, left, right, leave. You know, it's like, oh, you guys learn that and I'll come in and fix it, put it with music. So, but Benesh works for, ba for classical ballet, kind of. Lava notation is just a waste of time for everybody. Anybody else? Brandon. First of all, conducting <clears throat> is the most frightening thing of all time. And my basic, here, here's what happened. I, I'm so bossy and so opinionated and so, like, I never shut up that, did you just acknowledge, did you just <laughs> say, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, go on, go on, I got that part, yeah. Um, just a minute. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I've been working with composers and and conductors and musicians, singers, uh, instrumentalists for years and years and years, and I know what I'm doing. So I'm always coaching somebody. So even if it's a string quartet where there's no one conducting, I, with the score, rehearse in the studio with the dancers and decide, based on the, the music that's written, what, how it should be shaped and interpreted to a certain extent. And so since I do that all the time, it's like, well, why don't you just shut up and do it? Why don't you shut up and sing, you know, basically. So I s took some conducting lessons, probably the most important being Bugs Bunny. Sure. She was a great, great conductor. What's opera doc? Um, so I decided uh, for- As though people are hearing that for the first time, That's what's right. opera doc? I know. Amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> um, first time today. You know, yeah. you know. So I, for the 20 something, 20th anniversary of my company, I wanted to bring back some early pieces, one of them being the Vivaldi Gloria in D, which is an old chestnut of Baroque music, and it's wonderful. It's two, solo, two soprano soloists, a chorus, and a, a Baroque orchestra. And I thought, oh God, do I have to watch that dance again? I made it up when I was a child. It's so dumb and boring, and everybody loves it. The dancers love it. And Nancy Umanoff, who's the executive director of my company, says, why don't you conduct it instead of just being disappointed in how everybody else does? And I was scared, but I know the piece inside out. I'd sung it in high school when I was a tenor before I smoked for years and became a boss so. <laughs> and um, so I asked a, co a couple of conductor friends of mine to help me learn how to do it. And they basically taught me and coached me. It was very scary. On tour, I would practice with a string quartet and a pianist, which is already a miracle to have anybody to work with besides a mirror. And so I learned basic you know, beat patterns and how to do stuff more efficiently, something that I was already basically doing, like louder, faster, you know, quieter, that kind of stuff. Um, and so I did it, and it was quite successful. Then I added Dido and Aeneas. I'm going to be doing some more. I don't do a lot, but I do some. In the case of Dido, I used to dance it, and I choreographed it so I know it very well. And the scary part is you don't get to listen when you're conducting. Mm. By the time you listen, you missed it. And if you're not moving, everybody just stops. <laughs> so it's like, oh, let's see, I love this part. You have to stay a little bit ahead because of sound. You've seen it when, you know, if you're far away, a conductor looks like he's always going up. It's just because of the response, the sight versus sound time lag. And so it always looks like there's just somebody having a nervous breakdown in front of an orchestra. <laughs> And in fact, they fall, so the better the orchestra, the easier it is to do. Unfortunately, that's true of a lot of things. So it scares the shit out of me. I'm facing the other way. You know, I'm used to facing that way. Now I'm facing this way. And no matter how scared you are, you have to at some point make a downbeat or nothing happens. So it's like, okay, let's see. No one's going to dance or play unless I do this. 
So then you do that and then everything's fine. So in, for me, it's a very, very different kind of hearing music and responding to it. Although, you know, I don't want my dancers to hear something and then do it. I want it to all be simultaneous, which you just get used to doing with the players that you work with. So to stay a little bit ahead, and now I can say that famous thing that conductors have been, have been attributed to every conductor, where you say to the, dan the ballet company, how would you like it tonight, too fast or too slow? <laughs> so now I say that to my company. I'm like, but I mean, con conduct but conductors, <laughs> conductors have, stu have studied conducting. Yeah. Like, for example, Danny Kaye. You know, there was a thing about Danny mm -hmm. Kaye, like he was such a brilliant, who I love, he was such a brilliant impressionist that he could, li and such a talented guy, mm -hmm. he could literally pick up a clarinet and by doing an impression of playing it, play the clarinet, uh -huh. you know, just for the first time. Yeah. He could do that. And that's kind of, I suppose, what he did with conducting, yeah. quite famously. Was he actually... Do you, I mean, I'm not really asking this about Danny Kay, but more about people who aren't conductors who just love the music and are doing mm -hmm. a good impression of a conductor. Yeah. Are you doing a good impression of a conductor, or are you being a conductor? Yes. Um, both. Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, though? I absolutely yeah. do. Yeah. One thing is, well, on the strength of my conducting, Craig Smith, the late Craig Smith, who was a wonderful uh, musician in Boston, taught me my first lesson. Stefan Asbury, who's a living, wonderful conductor who I work with a lot, taught me. Jane Glover, Baroque specialist, <coughs> has taught me. Maestro Jimmy Levine, who I worked with at the Met, having seen my work and knowing me, said, well, you should, of course, you know more about it than anybody. Why aren't you conducting it? And this was all from conductors, right. not from the, not from right. the third desk violist. You right, know? right, right. But speaking of the third desk violist, I was conducting the Seattle Symphony in this Gloria Vivaldi, and everybody they go along with me because I know enough and I'm friendly and I don't pretend not to know. I don't pretend to know stuff I don't know. And this guy, this passive aggressive Seattle big shock there, um, <laughs> raises his hand. It's like, oh, excuse me. Yes. In B, you know, page number, bar number, beat number, is, do I have a C sharp or a C natural? And everybody else in the orchestra, they know this guy. So everybody's like. <laughs> I said, well, let's see. And I find the place. And I said, um. I don't know, I can't read alto clef. <laughs> and everybody was like, because <laughs> it's like, well, which one sounds, oh yeah, it's C natural, that's fine. You know, but it's, the thing is, it's not a music lesson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't have to teach somebody how to play of the viola. Right. By the time you're there, maybe you're good enough. And I can just say, well, you know, I want some, because I just worked with Philharmonia Baroque, this wonderful period instrument band in, in San Francisco. And I said, this, is, this needs to be scarier. And so a couple of them say, like, is this, how's it, you know, they're playing Ponticello or something, playing something scary. It's like, oh, that's great. Let's do that. Or is it an up bow or a down bow there? It's like, oh, I don't know. Let me hear it. So in fact, it's, so it's, it's I'm bullshitting and I know deeply what I'm doing. It's a bit, <laughs> so in other words, what it is, is that it's another of those things where it's not a kind of mysterious skill that only a few could learn, but mm -hmm. by knowing what you know and by liking what you do mm -hmm. by the force of your character and you can you know become a conductor yeah. i mean there's no reason why you shouldn't well i know it i know it the stuff very very yeah. well you wouldn't go into doing something that was only notes on a page to you that would be a ridiculous thing for you to do right right I could but it would be a different kind of work that i wouldn't necessarily want to do yeah absolutely <laughs> it's still to serve my dances that i do it oh sorry i forgot that was the world's longest answer no 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 that's great <laughs> Me? Yeah, you said you like Oh, I like them to read anything that doesn't have pictures. <laughs> but no, they all read, we, everybody reads a lot. And um, let's see. What, what good novels have you read by poetry, people actually. sitting next to you recently? <laughs> what? <laughs> I read, I've read your entire, ugh. I know you have. Yeah, it's very sweet. Which I love, which is why I met you, because, I mean, after I met you, why I loved you. Thank you. Because of the books, not yes. just because you're so gorgeous. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, a hero of mine is uh, Stanley Elkin. I loved, the, and sadly, there aren't any more of those. Mm. I just read that gigantic, fabulous Murakami book, because how could I not? I read everything else before. And uh, I don't know, Tristram Shandy, I'm, I'm reading because you told me to. I indirectly. remember you mentioned Elkin the first time yeah. we met, and I thought of you the I other day because I'm going to do this thing at uh, a Brown that I guess was started by, you know, Coover and Elkin, and, mm -hmm. and there was his name again. I love up. every one of those books. George isn't, Mills, isn't every, it? Every sentence is great. George Mills? George Mills. George Mills, yeah. yeah wonderful, yeah, yeah. irritating, irritating book. Yeah. Um, I don't know. 
I read, I read stuff that I need to for work. I'm just rereading the uh, Marriage of Cadmus and Harmony. Oh, What's his name? Yeah, Colossae. Yeah, yeah. Inc unbelievably great book. Yeah. I periodically reread um, the classical style. Um, what's his name? Charles Rosen. And so, you know, I read some, I read research stuff for what I'm working on. You know, I read a whole shitload of stuff for the death of Socrates that I just did. You know, I read a lot of Plato. And, but, you know, I'm not, I don't have much book learning. I read because I love to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I prefer the term raconteur. <laughs> no, <laughs> I loved it. I love Mr. Sedaris. Yeah, I think he's great. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> no, I love it. He's, you know, he's a wonderful. Yeah. Hmm. That's. A, oh, I'm, I feel trapped now. I have to think about that. You know who I love? Who I just read everything. Um. Uh, what's her name? What's her name? Lydia Davis. Yeah, yeah. I lost my mind. It's like, oh, come on. I'm gonna read this. Did one you get that sentence. nice card back they put out yeah, recently? Yeah, this big one. It's like, and I couldn't stop. Beautifully I went bound that book as well. What a great! It's a fabulous, fabulous. I think you recommend. I love her work. Anyway, I have... Nice to bring up writing a little bit at the end. <laughs> I have all of... <laughs> Good yeah, work. Right. You know, I worship Frank O'Hara. I have Frank O'Hara on my Kindle. <laughs> Com collected everything of Frank O'Hara, who I just love always. Yeah. My favorite film? Red Shoes. Silent... What? Red Shoes. Well, I love the Red Shoes. Oh. Of course I love that. What's that other one? It's that, it's that Stairway Tales to of Paradise? Hoffman. Oh, What's Matter that? of Life and Death. Matter of Stairway Life and Death. Heaven. It has two titles. Stairway Stairway to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, That's one of the great ones. By I agree. Team. That is my favorite. Well, my movie. Orpheus and Eurydice at the Met that I directed refers to that with all of the multiples of dead people. A hundred dead people in the chorus judging him. It was kind of wonderful. Anyway, that was about that. Um, favorite silent movie, Greed. Um... I hate more movies than I love. I hate all movies made today. Every movie I hate more than the last one. <laughs> I don't know why. And I, I sometimes, I don't know. I love, the, I love uh, Robert Altman. Probably Nashville is my favorite movie of all time. What about the genius cabinet of Dr. Calgary? Of course I love that. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh my, here's what you should get. Hard, maybe hard to find. Get Peter Sellers. My director friend did a, a version of that movie with Mr. Barishnikov in it, and it's called The Cabinet of Dr. Ramirez. And it's great. Get it. The score is the harm, Harmonielehre of uh, John Adams. So it's a very interesting, it. silent movie with a music score. The Cabinet of Dr. Ramirez. Uh, you know, there's so many. <clears throat> writing or not writing, there are so many. Um, things that you can learn about somebody at, from somebody at the top of their field and remaining at the top of their game uh, about taking risks with what you're doing and also doing the thing that you love and being able to do no other thing in a way. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to say it's a pleasure to know Mark Morris, but it's much greater that he bothered to come out here to talk to us this afternoon. So I would like a big round of applause for Mark Morris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mark Morris. Mark Morris. <laughs>